Uh, welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I am Jen Stout. I'm a journalist from Shetland. Uh, welcome to the 2023 Festival of Politics. This year's event uh, is the 19th year of the festival, provoking and inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in three days of hopefully spirited debate. I'm really looking forward to this discussion, hearing everyone's thoughts. Uh, it's good if everyone is given the opportunity to contribute, even if there might be differences of opinion. Uh, so good if we treat each other respectfully at all times. We're delighted you can join us today on this panel on Ukraine. Um, later, I will invite you to get involved with questions and comments. Uh, if you're keen to make your thoughts known online, you can do so using the channel. It's at Visit Scott Parl or you can do it on Instagram, and the event is being live streamed on the Parliament's SPTV channel. I'm very, very happy to be joined today by Dr. Hussein Aliyev, uh, Professor Vladislav Zubok, who will shortly appear on the screen, because he's joining us online, and Dr. Donette Murray. Dr. Hussein Aliyev is a lecturer in Central and East European Studies at the University of Glasgow. Uh, a lot of his research focuses on violent mobilisation and individual participation in armed conflict. Uh, Professor Vladislav Zubok, not quite here yet, is the Professor of International History at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He has expertise on the Cold War, the Soviet Union, Stalinism and Russia's intellectual history in the 20th century. And Dr. Donette Murray is here speaking in a personal capacity as an academic analyst. She is an author and practitioner with expertise in international security and strategic analysis, has worked on stabilization and institutional reform in Afghanistan and Kosovo, and delivered conflict management training in South America, the Balkans and the Middle East. So thank you for joining us. Are we getting uh, Professor Zubok, I hope? Yeah? Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, there will be a chance, a good long period of Q&A um, coming up, but I'll start with asking a few questions uh, of my own. Perhaps we can start just by summarising where we are, in your opinion, with the war in Ukraine today. Uh, thank you, Jen. I, I think we are currently at a very critical transitional period where Ukraine is trying to co conduct this massive counter-offensive and it's trying to retake uh, the territories which have been um, overtaken by Russia since last year and uh, we are yet to see where this counter-offensive leads Ukraine and we are yet, yet to see whether Ukraine succeeds in achieving its uh, initial objectives uh, uh, which uh, they had at the start of this uh, military campaign uh, earlier this this year, so uh, the, the, we are watching with, uh, with excitement as to the outcome of this campaign. Mm -hmm. Danette, I, I would I would agree and perhaps add that um, I, I think in in conflicts many points are actually very pivotal, and with this particular one, we're probably um, longer into a conflict than many people anticipated, and of course each phase. Um, has its own challenges and, and I think with Ukraine we are, as my colleague has just said, um, we're, we're watching very carefully to see where the, the balance of power is and what potentially might be what you could describe as an off-ramp um, or an on-ramp in terms of, of actually some kind of resolution. I mean, thinking back to, it seems quite a long time ago now, February 2022, to the initial response of Europe as a whole, um, that response, of course, within Europe was quite varied. How would you describe that and how would you describe how that has changed as the war has gone on? I think one of the most striking things about what we are seeing is the extent to which um, we have had um, a whole series of reactions from a number of international organisations. The European Union, um, in the passage of uh, sanctions legislation, for instance, and coming together in order to, to try and create a momentum um, to, to respond to the illegal invasion. NATO has um, itself been um, very much, I think, stimulated by what has happened in Ukraine. And as I think we'll probably come on to later, you have a, a process of expansion because there are those 
on the margins who have responded a particular way, feeling that they are insecure as a result of, of this invasion. So there has been, um, if not a rewiring complete of the security apparatus in Europe, there certainly has been a significant transformation. Yeah, any thoughts on particularly on NATO and how NATO has changed? I think that's a, something yeah, we're so probably going to come back to. I would absolutely agree. I think uh, NATO in particular is far more unified now in terms of uh, its response to Ukrainian crisis than it used to be when the conflict has started. And we are seeing uh, uh, a complete transformation of uh, uh, the levels of military aid, for example, uh, supplies uh, to Ukraine of such weapons as the main battle tanks or fighter jets that were absolutely out of question about a year ago, but now we're seeing uh, uh, both of these items either being supplied or being under discussion to, to get supplies. So we're seeing more willingness uh, among the NATO member states to contribute to the war effort to, and to make sure that Ukraine wins this conflict as soon as possible, which is obviously very much in the interests of NATO. I think we're joined by Professor Zubok. Can he hear us? That's correct. I'm here. Excellent. We're glad you're here. We, we've only just started, so I'll put this question to you as well. We're talking about the initial response of Europe, of various countries within Europe to the war and how that has changed over the past year and a half. How would you characterise that? Well, the, the war is, uh, is a very curious thing. First came the shock, although, of course, we now know that the American intelligence was quite well informed and prepared some European uh, politicians for that. But for, for the public opinion, it was a huge shock. And uh, as the war proceeded, the nature of the war, the goals of the war, uh, I think, kept changing. And that, you know, that produced different reaction. At first, uh, as we know, uh, everyone expected um, that uh, Zelensky uh, and Ukraine would lose the war quickly, given the, uh, the CIA estimates of, of the balance of power. Uh, and then it changed uh, its one to some, some optimism uh, after the European Union and the United States uh, um, uh, unveiled unprecedented uh, unprecedented scope of sanctions against Russia with a clear goal of uh, basically ruining Russian finances and Russian economy in a short period of time. And that uh, didn't work out. Uh, so it was like, you know, back and forth, a little bit like uh, uh, like uh, American roller coaster or Russian roller coaster, depending on that. And uh, uh, currently we are reaching the stage when more and more comments be begins to appear uh, that this is a stalemate. Uh, that where both sides uh, have no uh, military means to overwhelm the opposite side. So uh, that's that's where we are. But it's a huge question. I only touched on the main uh, the main points along the way. Thank you. Can everyone hear that well enough? Yeah. It's very difficult to hear. It's difficult what to hear. You Could you have a microphone? We we have microphones on. We do. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Can it can it go up a bit? Possibly. Okay. Uh, how, is this a bit louder now? How's this? Yeah. Okay. If you can't hear, do say. Please don't. Please don't just sit and think. Oh, this is really annoying. Okay. Good. I shall try and uh, speak loudly as well. Um, is it? Yeah. I mean, is it part of that? process that, that happened was arguably Ukraine, because there was, a, I mean, the general consensus at the time of the full-scale invasion was that Ukraine would fall very quickly. That there was no way it could withstand the might of the, you know, the great Russian army. And they really surprised everyone, didn't they? Yes, I think one of the reasons why there was this misconception that Ukraine won't be able to stand out to Russian invasion is because of uh, probably misunderstanding of the Ukrainian potential for mobilization, for civic mobilization, for popular mobilization. And this is what the Ukrainians did, for example, at the beginning of the first conflict with Russia in 2014 and 2015, when uh, they've raised uh, thousands and thousands of volunteers uh, and they've raised millions and millions of uh, dollars uh, to support the military effort at that time when the state was not able to provide either uh, the financial support for the war effort or to mobilize sufficient numbers of people. So Ukraine does have this amazing uh, potential for civil and uh, vol volunteering mobilization. Yeah, I think that's, we'll come back to that topic because I know it's something that you've done a lot of research on and it's, a, I think, a very key part of this, of this story. Danette, can we talk about some of the, the beyond Europe, the global implications of, of this conflict? 
I think it's probably worth pointing out that um, we, we see states and people experiencing the conflict and repercussions of the conflict in lots of different ways. Um, in, in the West, for instance, um, we looked at the implications in terms of rising energy costs and the impact that that had on the cost of living crisis. Um, we also opened our homes to Ukrainian refugees. So, so we actually processed um, some of what was happening in Ukraine in quite a personal way with, with, with sympathy and empathy as, as much as, as we could. Um, but it's also important, I think, to point out that what has happened in Ukraine has led to a significant disruption of global supply chains. So there are people and have been people in, in Somalia, in Sudan, in Yemen, in other parts of the world who have not been able to eat because of the rising cost of, of food. Um, and the reverberating effects that we're describing are, are therefore quite multifaceted. Um, in, in the sense of they, they will impact lots of people in, in lots of different ways. And there is a temporal dimension to this as well. So we've, we've got immediate um, reaction and responses and, and a hike in, in energy prices and so on. But the medium and longer term implications, some of these are, are known and we can anticipate and some of them um, will be slower burners. Um, and all that to say that how this affects people around the world um, w w has to be, I think, viewed in a longer term context rather than the immediate what we see on our TV screens. Of course, one of the, mm. one of the countries for which this is extremely significant and will cause a lot of changes is Russia. Uh, perhaps, Professor Zubok, you can talk about that. Uh, that, uh, as I started to say, um, the initial idea in the West was to impose such crushing sanctions on, on Russia that it would uh, lead to the meltdown, the run on the banks, uh, maybe hyperinflation, uh, the exit of uh, Western investments and the freeze on, on uh, financial, uh, financial transactions. And that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Uh, which contributed to the whole idea of the stalemate uh, later on. Um, why it didn't happen is still being studied by economists, but uh, we're living through the, one of the greatest experiments in, in modern history, in a sense when you know, the, the, the liberal order led by the United States uh, imposed uh, the maximum amount of sanctions short of war, short of uh, total blockade and war, on a mid-sized country uh, that is a nuclear superpower, a nuclear state. And that uh, did not lead to a visible deterioration of economy. It didn't lead to uh, inflation of any size. Well, recently, uh, after more than a year, you begin to see the weakening of the ruble now. Um, the Russian economy, instead of sagging considerably, uh, only uh, um, uh, went back by 2%, and in this first quarter of this year, even less so. J just to remind the audience, um, in the early 90s, uh, the, Russian the Soviet Russian economy sagged by 44%, and uh, during the uh, financial crisis of 2008, uh, it declined uh, by 7.8%. Uh, so we're seeing quite a significant and disappointing result of all this uh, 16,500 sanctions imposed by the West. And uh, again, it's, um, it shows uh, that uh, even with the liberal uh, 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 global order uh, united against the aggression, the rest of the world, the, the rest of the global market is not supporting these sanctions. It takes time. It de definitely, I'm not denying that these sanctions keep working, but they keep working in a longer term. And we may see some unexpected things next year, next summer, next fall, but, uh, but not yet. Yeah, can I ask you, I mean, the economic effects, as you describe, not as severe as it was thought or perhaps hoped. And there is, you know, a recurrent theme of people predicting the imminent collapse of Russia for quite a long time, and particularly over the last year. But politically, can Putin's government survive when many more people are being killed? How, how will that play out, do you think? 
Well, we, you know, when we read the Western press, we live in a little bit of schizophrenic world. On one, on one hand, we read that uh, Putin may fall, uh, you know, pre the Prigozhin mutiny happened, oh, that weakened Putin and all that. On the other hand, we read how ruthless is Putin's regime, that he can impose whatever hardships on the Russians. So we, we have to choose. Where's the truth? In between these two kind of viewpoints, um, I tend to think that given the um, nature of war, that is still a hybrid war for the Russians, the Russians uh, in their majority expect to stay away from this war. Every time when there are rumors of some kind of crisis, some kind of uh, mobilization, there's a wave of panic throughout the society. And indeed, this panic is a threat to the Putin regime because the idea of Putin's compact, if there's ever had been any compact between people and, and the Russian society, there will be no more major crisis, no more major war. And war is a crisis, of course. So we may see at some point when people, more and more Russian people realize that this, this is not a light war. This is not definitely no longer a short and victorious war, to be sure. But that's, uh, that's something uh, like a descent into economic and financial abyss, then we may see a certain uh, political crisis in Russia. But it's still, it's difficult to see how this crisis will play out, how it will develop. Because one feature of, of the Russian society is enormous gap, enormous uh, chat. I would say, between uh, Putin's entourage, the Russian elite, and the rest of the Russian people. And Putin certainly plays on this uh, a factor as sort of a new czar that um, willy-nilly remains the only guar guarantor of the fact that Russia would remain intact, that the Russian state would remain stable. So even those who, I don't know, dislike him, loathe him, hate him, uh, have to take this into account, that he is the guarantor of stability. Without him as a linchpin, if you pull out this linchpin, then indeed something terrible may happen to Russian state. And many people are not prepared to even to imagine such eventuality. Dr. Murray, thinking about the causes of this conflict, and I, I'm aware that word could mean many things. Let's just think about from, from the full-scale invasion from February 2022. Do you think that more could have been done? Was it preventable? I think the person who, who says yes or no with certainty is probably selling you something um, that you should distrust. This is an incredibly, has been, an incredibly complicated and difficult relationship um, that involves a range of states and individuals and challenges and agendas and expectations. And there will be a number of truths depending on um, whose perspective you are interested in and actually um, listen to most closely. I think from, from the perspective of, of, of many in the West, there were multiple opportunities um, and a significant amount of effort made to um, not only reassure, but also to, to communicate um, the consequences of an illegal invasion, particularly after the annexation of Crimea. So it, it's an interesting, um, it's, it's an interesting question but a very difficult one to answer because it will be entirely, I think, contingent upon an individual perspective. On a similar line, I mean, a lot of Ukrainians, I'm sure that we both know, have a lot of frustration over their perception that they weren't listened to for quite a long time. You might hear this in the Baltic states as well, that they were saying Russia is a threat, that, that no one did anything about Crimea. How, how fair is that? Well, it, it is very fair, and there's quite quite a degree of complacency in the West uh, for for ignoring the Ukrainian conflict uh, since 2014, when all, all, all of the um, uh, problems in Crimea and then in Donbass started, and uh, when Ukraine was basically uh, trying to um, highlight this issue and trying to bring this issue to the front of discussion. And uh, uh, there were a number of uh, efforts in the West uh, to to force Ukraine to accept, uh, to make some concessions, or to uh, at least uh, to uh, to leave. Uh, 
with the current situation and eventually that certainly contributed to, to, to the uh, Russian invasion in 2022. So uh, there, there were certainly lots of voices in Ukraine to, to prevent the war and to make the, the rest of the world understand that uh, there is a certain red lines which Ukraine uh, and Ukrainian successive Ukrainian governments are not able to cross and there are certain concessions that they simply cannot make and uh, uh, there was no government in Ukraine that could make any concessions on Crimean question as well as on Donbass question. So much of the uh, peace talks uh, that have been taking place since 2014, they were in a way doomed uh, because uh, there were lines which uh, neither of the Ukrainian governments could cross without uh, threatening their own position and their own stance. And in terms of the causes of this conflict, you know, it, it's often described to me as, oh, it's so confusing. And I think that's a bit of a cop out, it, but it is messy. Could you, could you pinpoint some, as you perceive it, some of the causes, perhaps going back quite a long time? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly uh, there, there's uh, quite a number of causes. Um, uh, quite a lot of them are closely interrelated and uh, they probably come down to a broader issue such as uh, Russian imperialism and uh, attempts specifically by Putin's administration to, to impose a Russian control over Ukraine, which uh, take us back to the Maidan revolution in uh, 2014 and uh, the overthrow of uh, uh, nominally pro-Russian Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych, which eventually has led to annexation of Crimea uh, and uh, the problems uh, in Donbass and uh, essentially the creation of this uh, de facto independent uh, uh, pro-Russian republics in Donbass. So uh, the efforts by, by Russian Federation to have uh, closer control of Ukraine, to keep Ukraine within its sphere influence are very typical for the post-Soviet region. We have seen the same things happening, for example, example, in the Republic of Georgia, where Russia has continuously tried uh, to um, struggle with um, pro-Western administrations and where it has similarly created uh, de facto independent states. And uh, uh, this is a basically a blueprint that Russia has used later on in Ukraine. It's interesting you mentioned Russian imperialism. I think for there, there are people who seem to only be able to see, I say, US hegemony, US imperialism. Um, blinding them perhaps to the fact that Russian imperialism in the form of the Tsarist state, in the form of the Soviet Union, that has been a pattern for a long time and that this behaviour is, is part of that pattern. Yes, absolutely. And uh, there are, well, there certainly there are different facets and different levels to Russian imperialism, which is a, a complex phenomenon. But uh, most and first of all, Russia attempts to uh, control the former Soviet states uh, to a certain extent, the Baltic states as well, which used to be the Soviet states, but more specifically, uh, non-EU um, former Soviet states in its vicinity, which it sees at it, as its own sphere of influence and where it doesn't want to see any other actors being involved and it doesn't really want the states uh, moving either towards uh, European integration or towards uh, military integration with NATO and so on. So uh, Russia was prepared to stand up to its own interests uh, in uh, uh, this immediate post-Soviet neighborhood. And we, we've seen quite a lot of examples of that happening uh, since the time Vladimir Putin became president in 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Zubok, what's your thoughts on, on that? Is this just a continuation of imperialism, of, of that pattern of behavior or something different, something new? Well, today, it's, 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 uh, and in general, it's impossible to deny that Russia was a country with uh, very strong imperialist uh, patterns and traditions of behavior. Um, I just don't want that even under the influence of this ongoing tragedy, we would simplify it and reduce it you know, that view Russia through the lenses of imperialism only. Don't forget that uh, uh, Russia went twice through the collapse of the state in 1917, uh, 20, and then in 1991, 92. Um, and it was not given at any point that that would be an automatic resurgence of the old imperialist uh, chauvinistic patterns. Uh, you know, after the revolution of 1917, we had an anti-imperialism, or some would say imperialism in the new communist form, at least. And after Putin, we had many 
uh, I mean, after 1991, after Gorbachev uh, in his anti-imperialistic rhetoric, we had all kinds of possibilities. I would say maybe they were fleeting possibilities, but possibilities nevertheless that uh, that, that should not be denied. Um, and even, and even uh, looking at that 2011, that inter interregnum of Medvedev, uh, yes, that coincided with that uh, war in Georgia, um, we we had very different rhetoric in the Kremlin. Uh, if you accept even the fact that yes, a Russian uh, leadership, Yeltsin, Putin, Medvedev, kept talking about Russia as being the uh, the center of the post uh, post imperial or neo imperial space around it. Um, there were different approaches, and some people you, you would even say in the Russian elites and Russian oligarchs, listen, we had all those economic lever levers in Ukraine. Why to invade it and crush everything that we had? We had enormous financial and economic uh, leverage over Ukraine before the open aggression started. So those people may be viewed as uh, new imperialists. They may be viewed as uh, economic, cultural imperialists, but certainly those people would not have moved divisions and uh, hundreds and thousands of tanks into the neighboring state as Putin did. So for me, it does uh, it does zero in on the question of Putin and his entourage and uh, the personality of Putin. So I don't want uh, you know Putin to be uh, exonerated of the exceptional exceptional responsibility for what happened. And just uh, uh, this responsibility uh, should not be spread evenly on on Russia or whatever it is. Yeah, this is actually a, a burning question I've, I've I've thought about for a long time. Is how on earth could he have made such a stupid mistake when, I mean, there was a very interesting piece in the Washington Post a few months ago of, based on long, long, long reporting. And it seems, because it, of course the Russian um, security services had long infiltrated Ukrainian society um, for various purposes, but partly to understand what was going on. So did they, were they not able to tell Putin that instead of troops being met with flowers and, and tears, they would be met with Molotov cocktails. Did he not understand that? And if not, how could that have happened? Well, it's not the first time in uh, Russian and Soviet history when old secret services, what they do, they try to cater to the leader's uh, uh, whims and, and an imagination. You know, I, I'm long, I'm old enough to remember the end of the 70s when Leonid Brezhnev was getting old and the KGB was reporting to him, hey, the entire Africa, Latin America, and Asia are going socialist communist and of course it was not true but the aging the aging general secretary liked that story so we have putin an aging autocrat uh, in self-isolation imagining that he uh, could do a a strange combination i would say of uh, americans in iraq in 1991 or 2003, sort of shock and awe, quick replacement of the Kievan regime with uh, some kind of a puppet state that would be pro-Kremlin, and simultaneously in Anschluss, when people would meet the Russians, uh, Russian troops with flowers. Uh, if, you know, otherwise, it's very hard to understand the first phase of this war when you know, all these columns of Russian uh, tanks and, and equipment uh, have been moving uh, into Ukraine without being prepared for an actual battle, which resulted uh, uh, tragically and ironically and happily for Ukraine, I should say, in uh, in uh, serious mauling, serious destruction of the cadre army uh, of Russia that, that is irreplaceable, as military experts tell us. Now, this is all a result of Putin's immense self-delusion uh, and uh, secret services just catering to his self-delusion. Uh, Dr. Murray, can we talk about NATO? It's a very, very big part of this story and often the most controversial one um, when, when, when things are debated. I mean, earlier this year, Finland became the 31st member of NATO. Sweden is now applying for membership, depending on Turkey. Can you describe some of the effects of this war on NATO as an, as an organisation, as an institution um, and its, its goals? I think we have touched on this already in, in terms of um, identifying the fact that um, A, this was a spectacular um, misjudgment on Putin's part for reasons that, that we've just outlined um, and also because of the, I, I suppose, the extent to which 
the command and control mechanisms in, in the Russian state um, really prevented anybody from, from calling out the, the emperor is not wearing any clothes um, and, and the implications that that had for reacting to what was coming from the centre and, and, and then actually um, offering a challenge function. And I, and I say that as a little bit of context because um, I think what we have seen with NATO is um, a very conscious attempt to, to understand um, the nature of the threat and to um, make a determination about how the organisation should evolve in order to meet that threat and, and what the requirements are in order to protect existing members, but also how to respond to the calls for support that came very, very rapidly from outside of the organisation. So we, we, we've mentioned, for instance, Georgia, um, Georgia, Moldova, um, Kosovo, talking about the need to be on the inside where they felt or would feel more protected, as opposed to being on the outside, as Ukraine was and is, um, where there is a perception of vulnerability. Um, and therefore, the rewiring, the reimagining of the security architecture in Europe that I mentioned at the very beginning. We have seen that in terms of a growing membership of NATO um, and, and with Turkey's um, assent, Sweden will, will, will obviously um, be the, uh, the, the next one to, um, to, to join. Um, that is part of an ongoing attempt to protect NATO's flank and to, to, to really bring to life what is at the heart of the alliance, which is Article 5, and an attack on one is an attack on all. The alliance formed in 49 um, has been successful, um, not least because A, it is still kicking and screaming, um, and operating and, and, um, and training and so on together. It is a force um, and it is an evolving force. And as the most recent um, NATO summit demonstrated, and as we have mentioned already, there is a sense of unity and purpose that I think has, has been rekindled as a result of, um, of the, the, the tragic events in Ukraine. I mean, do you think there's been more cohesion among, between European parties, European states and uh, perhaps institutions as well as a result of this, or, or more division? I mean, the debates taking place in Germany have sounded very different to those perhaps in, in the Baltic states over how to help Ukraine or if to help Ukraine. The, the fact that you have an organisation of 30, 31, 32, and so it continues, member states who, who come together who agree a common denominator, who, um, who, who plan and write and develop and implement policy together, who exercise together. Um, the very fact that you can have that and you can keep that together for, for decades, I think is really powerful because will you have disagreements? Um, of course you will. Do you have mechanisms for overcoming disagreements? Yes, we have, we have seen that with NATO. And I think there's a really interesting and strong contrast that you can draw between that alliance and a single state noting that um, Russia has Belarus and a number of other supporters, but, but you have a very, very different type of organization um, and that contrast is, 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 as I say, I think particularly powerful. Dr. Aliyev, can we talk about the prospects currently facing Ukrainians, uh, those, those abroad still, those many who have returned and those still living under daily threat of bombardment? 
Well, this, uh, the economic situation and obviously this, uh, the overall human security in Ukraine uh, are very serious issues and that's why we have these millions of refugees who have left Ukraine and uh, uh, that is, uh, that there is a likelihood that many of them will return to Ukraine when Ukraine becomes a safer place and when there are opportunities uh, to, to live and work in Ukraine without the threat of uh, constant uh, Russian missile attacks and bombardments. But as things stand, uh, there is likely to be a further out flow of uh, uh, civilian population for, from Ukraine as uh, uh, l last winter, this winter we we've experienced this massive uh, Russian missile com campaign, the missile attack campaign on Ukrainian energy infrastructure, essentially forcing thousands and thousands of Ukrainians to leave their homes uh, uh, because uh, they were left without heating, they were left without homes and they were left, left without jobs. But we might expect a similar attempt uh, by Russia. Uh, to do something like that in the coming winter so that we might expect uh, further waves of uh, migrants uh, leaving Ukraine because of uh, uh, overall insecurity and um, uh, economic and uh, human insecurity and instability. It's, it's very interesting how, I mean, in my experience in Ukraine, people, and this is true of people all over the world, but people are extraordinarily adaptable, adaptable and resourceful. So even what seems like a completely impossible situation, like staying in a city of millions of people um, when there's no power and no heat, you know, that there would be these ingenious solutions, uh, often involving lots and lots of generators and so on. So it's, it's extraordinary what people can actually withstand and not leave the country. Um, and, and then many return to a situation that you'd think would be impossible to return to, but it's still preferable to being a refugee for an indefinite period of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I would absolutely agree. Ukrainians, just like most other post-Soviet nations, are uh, quite adapted to hardships, uh, especially uh, during the post-Soviet period in the 1990s when there were lots of blackouts all over the former Soviet Union. In Ukraine in particular, lots of shortages of uh, uh, running water, gas and electricity. So in a way, Ukrainians um, have um, coping mechanisms uh, to deal with these daily problems. But when these daily problems become overwhelming uh, because of the Russian invasion, it obviously becomes unbearable and it forces a lot of people who would otherwise not leave their households and not leave uh, their uh, towns and villages uh, to migrate el elsewhere. And possibly quite a lot of them are, are willing to return as soon as the conditions are right. Uh, we'll come to audience questions in about five minutes. I just want to ask each panellist how you see the next six months going in this conflict. Uh, Professor Zubok, would you? Well, I'll start with short-term predictions that are impossible to make because August is the, time, is the month of surprises in Russian history. In 1991, there was a coup and uh, all of a sudden, a few months later, the Soviet Union was no more. So we have to wait until the end of the August, this August. Uh, but in terms of sh uh, medium-term and longer-term predictions, I'm afraid things are moving into the stalemate stage. And uh, for obvious reasons, uh, in, that very few people want to discuss what will happen to, to Ukraine if, the, if the, uh, this forecast of the stalemate uh, realizes itself and in six months, in one year and six months, we'll be pretty much in the same situation with the same uh, kind of a huge front line um, and uh, both sides uh, lobbying, uh, lobbying missiles uh, across it uh, into each other's territory. Uh, that, um, of course, raises the main question, what will happen to economies and finances on both sides? And Putin clearly um, bets on on the, on greater resilience and greater resources of, of Russia and Ukraine bets on its own ingenuity as we discussed and also on on the help of the West. So both sides for for a while are prepared to go into this longer stretch without uh, any concessions and any negotiations. Charlie. I would, I would agree with my colleagues that we should probably be preparing for a protracted conflict where both sides are clearly prepared to, to uh, continue this conflict for as long as it's necessary. And uh, uh, just judging by the previous six months period, there were no significant uh, uh, dramatic changes in how this conflict evolved. So we probably should be prepared uh, for something like that, of course, hoping for, for this conflict uh, to develop uh, for, for the best. for for Ukrainian victory. And Dr. Murray, do you see any surprises on the horizon possibly or, or agreeing with that? 
I think broadly we'd be wise to actually um, view this as, as, as quite difficult to predict. Um, there are things we can track. So for instance, we can look at the appetite um, for continuing support. I mean, you, you, you mentioned um, some of the, the challenges in Germany um, and differences of opinions. Um, that, that will absolutely um, continue to feature to a greater or lesser extent. So tracking the commitment, um, the United Kingdom has been incredibly committed to, to supporting um, Ukraine in, in, in lots of, of, of different ways. Um, I think it's also useful to keep an eye on what's happening internationally. So we've had um, a number of, of different attempts to, um, to convene some kind of peace negotiations or, or discussions about um, how the conflict might be resolved. And connected with that, um, significant actors who have been um, perhaps on the fence in a, you know, reminiscent of the, the non-aligned era, um, but China and India, for instance, are, are, are just two. It's, it's interesting to watch um, how they continue to, to view the situation, um, and, and that will be to an extent, as is true of all states. Um, part of the decision making that, that they will do in terms of working out what's best for them, both nationally and internationally. Okay. Thank you. We're going to come to audience questions. If you keep your hand up, please, until the roving mic reaches you and you had your hand up first, sir. And aim for brevity so that everybody gets a, a question in, please. Yeah. Uh, Peter Cooper, uh, <coughs> Ukraine Solidarity Committee um, Campaign Scotland. Um, yes, it's a colonial war. Uh, we have to be absolutely clear about that. Uh, that Putin's project is to uh, rebuild the Tsarist Empire, um, uh, specifically rejecting the Soviet Union model. Uh, and also, uh, he doesn't. He denies the existence of Ukraine as a nation. He den it's it's as if England invaded Ireland again and said, oh, well, you speak English, and therefore you don't exist as a separate nation. It's, it's as simple as that, and uh, we have to support Ukraine in this fight. The second point is that there is a, um, a broader aspect which hasn't really been touched on in this discussion, which is that this is also a fight for democracy which is that all the dictatorships around the world, from Xi Jinping, uh, the authoritarian regime, Modi, uh, uh, Orban, uh, all these people are either neutral or explicitly backing Russia because that's the model that they aspire to. And this is a battle for democracy to re retain that margin that we have in our societies for actually f freedom of expression, for organization, uh, to, to, to gain social progress and not simply to be uh, simply to be have it have it imposed on us by an authoritarian uh, regime. The last question, the last point is, is that it's also and first and foremost a fight for self determination, an issue which should be dear to many people in Scotland, which is that this is about the right of a nation to rule itself if that's what it wants. It's the highest democratic issue of all, because if you don't have self-determination, you can't have elections, you can't have anything else, uh, just like you didn't in the British Empire. Uh, the only people who had the vote were the people who happened to, happen to, li happened to live within the U bounds of the UK. Um, so uh, if we don't win this fight, then it will be a blow against democracy on a world scale, because the strong men, and they all are men, uh, will say, this is the model, this is, the this is, this is what, this is the future and it will strengthen the right and the fascist forces within Western societies. And that's why we have to win. The last point... I'll wrap you up, please, because uh, okay. other people it want to ask questions. Mate? Yes, maybe at the moment it is a bit of a stalemate, but why is that? Is because NATO is providing arms to uh, Ukraine through an eyedropper. 15 Sherman tanks, 15 challenger tanks Peter. and so on and so forth Peter, yes, I am, we're going to stop I'm now finishing, okay but that's the reason why and the reason why it needn't be a stalemate if the uh, if we provided ukraine with the arms that they need thank, thank you. you i think we can just go to another question 
Uh, yes, there's a gentleman at the front here. Thank you. I, I, I want to begin by saying that, uh, in case my later remarks might be misunderstood, that, um, and I think that what Putin has done is completely indefensible. Um, however, I take a rather pessimistic view about the eventual outcome of this conflict. Um, I, I, mean, I agree that we've reached a stage of, of stalemate. Um, I also agree that um, the uh, Western material support to Ukraine is stronger now than it was a year ago. But um, I, I mean, I, I fear that um, a longer war will actually suit Russia. Um, and the, the, the Russian people, like the Ukrainian people, uh, have been accustomed to hardship. Uh, I think Professor Zhu made the point that uh, back in the 1990s, there was a 44% uh, decrease in the economy. Now, admittedly, that's, that's 30 years ago now, but uh, the memory remains. Uh, Russians are, are used to hardship. There is no obvious sign that public support um, for the so-called special military operation is declining in Russia. Uh, the prospects, if Putin were deposed, seem to be much more likely that he would be, he would be replaced by somebody not anti-war, but who thought that Putin had not been uh, progressing the war uh, as he should have done. Um, and uh, the Russians are accustomed to a long war in which eventually their superiority in numbers uh, prevails. Um, so I'm afraid I take a rather pessimistic view of, of, of what may happen. And I would like, I would like to ask the oh, members of the panel yeah. if they can give me reasons to be a bit more optimistic. Thank you. Dr. Murray. <clears throat> to the point about the triumph of liberalism and, and, and what really matters about your commitment to liberalism and, and what you get from that, you get protections, you get um, you get a space within which differences are tolerated and that goes to the heart of liberalism. I, I think my reason for optimism and I acknowledge the tremendous hardship um, and, and also the unpredictability of both a short-term conflict and a long-term. Both can be, and as this war has demonstrated already, horrendously um, disruptive and, and, and catastrophic for the 8 million refugees, the 7 million IDPs, um, the destruction that runs into the billions. That's what we've had so far and, and that is incredibly tragic and, and appalling. But I, but I think if we um, are standing up for um, those people and we are attempting to defend liberalism, which we are doing, in, certainly with, with allies and partners, then, then that gives um, a weight that at least allows me to, to, to look at what's happening um, with, with a more optimistic mindset, because I think people can do extraordinary things when they actually commit to the protection of others. And, and if I may just add one piece, I think what Ukraine has, has brought home very viscerally is the human dimension to conflict and, and, and how people, individuals, are affected. And, and doctrine and training and so on and, and commitments made by very many governments in connection with protection of civilians, for instance, the support to the humanitarian community. These are all, um, these are all part of our reaction to Ukraine. And I think even in terms of, of just highlighting protection issues, protecting um, sexual violence and conflict issues, um, raising the, those kinds of, 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 of questions about how we do this, how we protect people, how we train people to protect people. These are corollaries. They are, they are not good in and of themselves, but they are corollaries of a conflict. And for me, that's something at least to be optimistic about. 
Professor Zubok, um, is a, a lengthy war in Russia's favour? No, I think it's uh, in everyone's disfavour. Um, I actually published a piece in Foreign Affairs in December 2022 when I argued that the longer war is against the interests of uh, everyone, including Europe, um, including the rest of the world, because the, the longer the, this war, and I would call it a big European regional war, but it has enormous enormous uh global implications the longer it lasts the uh, more you know the more we have we have negative uh whatever position we take you know and i heard both speakers uh, with great interest um whatever position you take the longer this war lasts uh, the, you know the worse we are off because the war is an absolute evil and it leaves scars it leaves disruption in, in global economy and so on and so forth but there's reason why we have all these different uh, estimates even from the audience uh, today because there are different readings of this war even in you know under the surface of nato unity even under the surface of a uh, western sort of um, uh, agreement moral uh, high ground on 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 this question um because in 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 those countries that used to be uh behind the iron curtain uh they were part of the soviet empire there's a natural uh narrative of uh, you know fighting back for democracy against the new enslavement against you know the new colonialism and so on and so forth but you know as you go further Westward, you know, this narrative is not not understood and not shared. And Germany is, is going through a huge agony of trying to find a new uh, foreign policy identity for itself, if you like. And when you continue, and I bypass the United Kingdom, I don't want to discuss the, the UK position here. It's for the experts. But if we, if we move to Washington, uh, then we have a, 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 a fear of escalation in Washington that is based on Washington's global commitments and on the experience of the entire Cold War. And the fact is that from the start of this war, uh, the Biden administration behaved, treaded very carefully and did not want to uh, cross any imaginary red lines with Putin. And now, since then, we, we see the administration crossing many red lines, but very, very carefully, very gradually. It's sort of the escalatory domination of the old Cold War times. So uh, the Washington War and the Washington reading of war is much more, how to say, burdened with the responsibilities and experience of the past. And that prevents Washington, I guess, to go all gung-ho and just dump all the weaponry, whatever it has, to, you, to the Ukrainians and see a Ukrainian victory. At least this is my reading of how, how these differences play out. Thank you. Would you oh, like not to optimist, comment? by the way. Not, not mm -hmm. optimism. Yes, I think there is a space for optimism. Uh, just talking about the military type of things, uh, uh, military dimension of this conflict, I can see Ukraine becoming uh, stronger every month and I can see Russia becoming weaker every month. Russia has lost its elite units. It, uh, it has lost a lot of uh, highly professional, experienced military personnel, which has which it has spent decades to prepare. Uh, it has lost a lot of weapons and it has lost a lot of ammunition. It's struggling with the war effort and uh, we certainly experience a certain level of uh, stalemate on the uh, battlefield, but uh, we can still see Ukraine uh, slowly pushing forward, breaching through, chewing through the, Ukraine, uh, the Russian defenses, and most likely will be achieving some progress on the battlefield. We, we don't know whether Ukrainians will achieve the objectives, which is moving uh, to the Crimean Peninsula and uh, liberating uh, larger territories in Donbass, but uh, we are certainly seeing Ukraine becoming stronger militarily it, it's becoming uh, also strong uh, as, as a democracy in terms of processes that happen in terms of uh, the fight against corruption, uh, institutional reforms and institutional building also becoming potentially closer to EU membership and possibly NATO membership. So uh, there is a hope for Ukraine. In terms of uh, societal processes, uh, Russians are certainly used to hardships. Uh, there is no denial. Uh, but uh, in terms of the level of societal involvement, we can see Ukrainians uh, 
crowdsourcing a lot of the war effort, uh, much of the this military drones which Ukraine has, and uh, now it's producing thousands of them. They crowd crowd uh, sourced, so Ukrainians, regular Ukrainians, all over the world, they contribute to this effort continuously. Although it's been over a year now, but uh, the levels of funding that uh, regular Ukrainians are providing uh, into this war effort are quite formidable. It's not the same in Russia, though, although there were some efforts at crowdsourcing and at helping the Russian military machine at uh, purchasing equipment for the Russian units, which they lack. But it has been done on a, such a small scale. So uh, the, there might be levels of support for Putin. There might be levels of support for the so-called uh, special operation. But uh, there's very little um, ground level grassroots initiative among the Russians, uh, Russian public, uh, broadly speaking, unlike the Ukrainian public. So Ukrainian public is far more committed uh, to uh, succeeding in this conflict, uh, returning their lands and uh, uh, winning uh, the, this war overall. Let me take another question, please. Uh, woman down here. Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't seen you. It's very bright behind you. Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, Beth Cross, I'm a researcher in children's rights. Um, I was uncomfortable with some of the framing as Russia as the victim or maybe an unsuccessful victim. Russia also had an economic policy. It was going to freeze Europe to submission along with Ukraine and that failed. But my main thing and my question I would like to ask is why have we not used the word genocide yet today? How can we even talk about this war without talking about this? Tens of thousands of children have been abducted. They are forced to speak only Russia. Eyewitness accounts of the few who have been returned um, narrate that children who refuse to believe are disappeared. Tens of thousands. There is a Ukrainian effort to try to document this. Where is the international community? When the dam broke, local NGOs were going in under fire and the UN refused. They said, oh, we can't because how, how can that be? The International Red Cross is actually complicit and within the abductions. There's concern that they actually participated in some of this abduction by Russians of Ukrainian children. So this is my question. I, how, how will, not, not Ukraine, not NATO, will the UN survive as a credible organization given this, these failures? Dr. Murray. The United Nations is 193 states. Um, that's a big common denominator that you often have to find when the organization seeks to get things done. And at its heart is um, a security council that operates in a particular way because um, when it came into being, the, the only way that you could essentially get that organization up and running was to acknowledge that there were powerful actors and there were actors who lacked power. And that has created a system that is um, hard to describe as perfect and one that is easy to, to criticize. And I absolutely acknowledge the, you know, the significant concerns that have been raised historically um, and more recently about the functionality of the only organisation that we have of the United Nations type. To go into specifics, um, you would have to spend a wee bit of time, I think, looking at the International Criminal Court and the indictments and the processes connected with that. You would need to talk a little bit about how the International Court of Justice functions. Um, you would need to talk about the principle of universal jurisdiction um, and some of the challenges I think that you've, uh, you have acknowledged in documenting um, and the experiences of, of those on the ground in terms of being able to, to, to bring together information that may not be used or usable right now, but in several years down the line might actually be the difference between um, horrendous mass atrocity crimes being successfully prosecuted or not? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm grateful for your question. I, I don't think we framed Russia as a victim, or I certainly haven't intended to. Um, and I would add that, I mean, this question about 
<laughs> about genocide, about human rights, is one that I feel very deeply. I mean, I've been involved in, in, as a journalist, documenting the disappearances of people from Kharkiv region. And I've also been involved in some very difficult and emotional discussions um, between Ukrainians and, say, Western lawyers who they operate within very specific legal terms. And so when they were saying it doesn't quite constitute genocide or we're not quite sure that it would get you there over the line in the International Criminal Court, that's obviously very difficult for Ukrainians to hear. So I, it is a very, very live topic um, and a really interesting and crucial one. I, do you have any thoughts on this, on the issues of whether it's genocide? Is that a useful word to use? Uh, the only thing I would add uh, that is extremely challenging to, to conduct investigations in an ongoing armed conflict because uh, investigators will simply have no access to, to some of the areas, especially Russian controlled areas, and it's quite possible that we will learn and we will uh, we'll know much more about uh, atrocities that are being committed on those Russian controlled areas of, of Donbass, for example, after the war is over and after investigators have actually access to witnesses and uh, they have access to evidence. So we probably only know a tiny fraction of what's, uh, what's being uh, done in those territories. Professor Zubok, would you like to come in on any of this? Um, I'm reading a book uh, that is very sobering uh, by Samuel Moyne. It's called Humane, about how Europeans and just people in the West in general, and also in Russia, like Count Leo Tolstoy, uh, created the pacifist movement or debated what to do about the war, how to make the war humane, how to prevent wars. And you know, the outcome, as, as we see today, is, is very unsatisfactory, very frustrating. Um, and the UN was created in 1945 by great powers for great powers, including the Soviet Union, of course. But also uh, the United States voted for the system of the Security Council at the time, including blatant isolationists like uh, and, and, and internationalists uh, because of the system of veto. Because the United States, uh, after 1945, had never allowed uh, itself to be called an aggressor. It never allowed itself to be called, you know, in, a fr in infringement of uh, the rights of war and uh, the rules of war, even after Korea, even after Vietnam, and so on and so forth. I'm not building any moral equivalency, God forbid, but all I'm saying that this is a system we have, that's the only system, it's hugely imperfect. And yes, even at the time in 1945, 46, human right defenders and people like Lemkin were, you know, tearing their hairs out, basically saying this is the system for great powers, not for real observation of human rights. Thank you. Next question. Uh, yes, yourself there with the glasses. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so with a few exceptions in Dr. Lee, for which I'm very grateful. Um, I want to ask, why do you think we're able to have this conversation today as if Ukraine was not there? And I'm saying this as a Ukrainian person today. Um, why are we talking about the effects on the global supply chains? We're talking about the effects on the energy markets. We're talking about the effects on European politics, supposedly global economy. We're even talking about the effects on Russia. And why in the event that is called Ukraine, we're normalizing this damage by not even acknowledging the deaths, um, the genocide, for which I'm grateful for you to bring that in, the ecocide that is happening, um, the harm that we are not explicitly uh, referring to. While we are having this discussion today, just now, there has been an air alert in Ukraine, which means Russian bomb can fall anytime, anywhere, and bring more harm and more deaths. And it breaks my heart to hear both sides of the story, multiple sides of the story, the complexity of the story. And I can see how that position renders you supposed neutrality and objectiv objectivity that is only possible from the position of privilege and safety that you are speaking today. And on a more practical level, because I suppose that's maybe a more rhetorical question. I would like to hear what 
are you how are you working with existing on the ground initiatives here in Scotland because we're having this conversation here today um, to support Ukrainian victory thank you thank you this has been and continues to be a breathtakingly brutal conflict that has um, or at least I, I, I think um, we have tried to acknowledge and perhaps not acknowledged um, sufficiently clearly um, that has first and foremost had an incredibly difficult impact on the people of Ukraine. I don't think there's, there's, there's any doubt about that. We're in a position today, I think, where we can't say with any degree of authority how many people have died, um, the injuries, the longer term impacts on individuals, on communities, on families, the, the separations, the you know, longer term impacts. I, I don't think anybody would want to in any way suggest that that, that is not at the heart of, of what we're discussing here. Um, and I think that to take a second and acknowledge that is entirely appropriate. And then if we can use that to say, we think the impact on people is so horrendous that we want to stop it and we want to try and ameliorate that as much as we possibly can and to move to that conversation I think necessarily puts us into a conversation about politics, about organisations, about mechanisms for, for achieving that aim and we do so and we, and we highlight that point acknowledging that there are so many different actors involved in this. The, the terrain is multifaceted. You have military, you have civilian, you have third sector, you have private corporations, you have so many people who have some role in, in, in this conflict. Okay, thank you. Yes, I will add that uh, the topic of Ukrainian conflict is really multifaceted. There's uh, just so many dimensions uh, to this conflict and uh, currently it's a conflict that involves uh, much of the world. That's where uh, the, the, the implications are really far, far going in terms of the um, economic implications, but also in terms of political implications. So, so many various organizations that are involved in these processes. But I absolutely share the sentiments of, of, of of the commenter and uh, this this is a conflict that has personally affected uh, so many million people and uh, uh, definitely um, have been involved in uh, quite a lot of ground level pro projects and uh, have family in Ukraine myself who live in Chernigov uh, region on, pretty much on the front lines and who go through all this uh, daily uh, alarms so all this uh, air raid alarms so I absolutely share the sentiments. Professor Zubok. Well, I, uh, I should say this is an epic tragedy uh, for the Ukrainian people. And I, when I say this may be the stalemate that will last for another year, I say it with tremendously heavy heart because that, I know, it translates into tens of thousands of uh, killed, wounded, maimed, uh, orphans, and, and so on and so forth. The human dimension is all about the war uh it's not the battle of machines it's the battle of humans so the russian government launched that tragedy uh no doubt about it and back to my uh previous attempt to say that the, the european thinking uh, revolves around three ideas how to end this war one and the least practical idea is pacifism to outlaw this war and so on and so forth it's evil let's stop fighting um you know some people in in rome may have 
thought so, and this is totally dismissible, of course. The second idea is humanization of war, to make it more human, stop abducting children, stop you know, uh, targeting civilians, stop doing this, stop doing that. We see that it's not happening, right? And the final idea is sort of the most popular idea today to end this war through quick victory. Uh, of some sort. But unfortunately, we're not seeing this scenario uh, being effectuated as well. There was a brief hope, returning to my previous argument, to, uh, to force Russia to end this invasion by uh, crushing its economy and crushing its finances. And it didn't work out. So right now, we looking at the battlefield, trying every day to see any signs of what, what is going on. And unfortunately, you know, we're not seeing any, any, any decisive uh, changes. So we are going back to uh, square one, unfortunately. And those people who compare the current campaign to World War I increasingly has a point, I'm afraid. Uh, can I thank you for your question and your point? And I agree we should hear from more Ukrainians. And I, I know there's a lot of hands up still. And if, if, if there's anyone from Ukraine who wants to ask a question, please let me know. Um, and I'll give you the yes. I'm just wondering what the panel think of the possibility, if the war does continue for another year, could, could you ever see a position where there could be an imposed settlement, perhaps through the UN, where Russia gets to keep certain parts of territory, but in exchange for a secure Ukraine, which is a member of NATO and a member of the European Union. Is that possible, or would Russia just never accept that? <sighs> briefly. Yes, briefly. I don't think, uh, as things stand, Russia is ready to make any concessions, especially of that type. So uh, maybe we would see some significant changes in a year's time, but that's definitely not the current state of things. I'm going to move to another question, if that's all right. Has anyone had their hand up a long time and I've just not seen you? All right, I'll go to yourself. Wait for the mic. There you go. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm Colin Fox from the Scottish Socialist Party. It's a delight to be back here in the Parliament 20 years after I was elected. Um, I wonder if I could ask three brief, but it seems to me central questions that have come out of the questions that you asked here. And one is, isn't it possible to interpret what we're facing with the war in Ukraine by drawing the conclusion that this isn't in fact a conflict that began in February 2022, that in fact it's a conflict that's been ongoing within Ukraine for more than two decades, principally concerned with Ukraine's membership of NATO and Ukraine's membership of the European Union, which has been promised to the people of Ukraine for that period of time. And that's the first question, because to me, that's been missed so far in the presentations that have been raised. In other words, that this isn't a conflict that began in February 2022, it's much longer. Six. 2014, of course. Well, there you are. So 10, 10, um, 10 years ago. In other words, there's been an internal conflict within Ukraine itself for at least a decade or more. And it's important to understand the history. Otherwise, you won't understand the present. Second thing is, Chair, is that you said in your answer, you asked the question eight, uh, isn't it the fact, the question that Ukraine hasn't been listened to? And couldn't it be interpreted that, in fact, there has been voices within Ukraine arguing for EU membership and NATO membership within the country for that period of time that are delusional, mistaken, and we're sitting here today, isn't it the case, that both membership of the EU and membership of NATO is a long, long way off for Ukraine, even at the present time. And the third uh, question, uh, Chair, is I was struck by question nine, you seem to be incredulous to how on earth Putin could have made such a mistake as he did in 2022. And it seems to me surely it's not as difficult as the three panellists had suggested, because Putin and the Russian uh, regime have made it clear that they see Ukraine's membership of uh, NATO to represent an existential threat to Russia. 
And therefore, that is perfectly clear what their motivation is, that these talks have failed for a long time. And my final point in reference to that is the panel and the discussion over an hour talked very much about Russian imperialism, and rightly condemned it, but made no reference to NATO imperialism, Western imperialism, the EU's imperialism, which surely also has a part to play in this conflict and its understanding of the way forward. Okay, there are several questions in that. Um, I do want to give other people a chance to speak. Um, Professor Zubok, can I come to you with perhaps that last question uh, that Colin made there? That's a hugely contested uh, issue of uh, what was the impact, if ever, of the NATO enlargement and uh, the promise by George Bush Jr. in 2008 uh, that uh, Russia, that Ukraine and Georgia uh, would one day become members of NATO. If you talk uh, to American uh, experts, they say, oh, we, we didn't mean it. Ukraine was as far from NATO as as it is, uh, you know, until uh, until 2022. Uh, but for, you know, we, we keep zeroing in on Putin and in Putin's head, that was probably the red line crossed by by uh, by the US president, whom, by the way, Putin considered his partner. And after the, the, the war on terror started after 9-11, Putin called Bush and hoped uh, to work with him as a partner. So without going into too much into psychology and uh, you know personal psychology of Mr. Putin, I think that that was a factor. However, I do not I would not ascribe uh, too much uh, uh, to, to to the NATO enlargement. There were many other things, and I think the crucial thing was really that Putin associated himself with that marginal, rather marginal and bizarre view in among Russian nationalists. Um, that Ukraine, uh, Russia, and Belarus are part of one superethnos, uh, superethnos, and that was, you know, very uh, popular among marginal Russian imperialists and, and nationalists. And suddenly, Putin adopted this view, um, and it became basically the driver for his actions. And this is the most surprising thing about history that historians find very hard to explain when and how this cliques in the mind of the authoritarian leader. But the consequences of this are very clear, very clear. Not only Putin regarded NATO enlargement into Ukraine as an existential threat, and he said it as, uh, you know, the uh, as, as, as spokesman from the audience reminded us, but he also viewed Ukraine as essentially a uh, part of Russian realm our part of land. And I remember his speech before invasion, they they think that we're invading. No, we're taking back what is ours. So these, this factor, I think, for, uh, was much more important than that NATO enlargement and geopolitical tension that it caused. Dr. Murray, perhaps there's other bits of this you want to come back to, but I'll ask you um, the question about we're listening too much to what Colin referred to as delusional voices in Ukraine arguing for EU membership. The EU, like NATO, as, as you will know as well as I, um, require and expect as part of membership that, that states who join are committed to um, a number of things, including liberal democracy, and are able to um, ensure that their economies are going to be able to, to function and align with and so on. Um, and, and I think Ukraine's aspiration, um, Georgia's aspiration, Moldova's aspiration to, to join the EU um, is motivated by a desire to, to be part of an organisation, a club, if you will, that gives access to the largest market, um, there will be attendant benefits and so on. I don't need to repeat those to this audience. Um, so there is a mechanism for joining. And, and, and when that alignment is, is supported and facilitated, um, Ukraine will join. And I think the European Commission, the EU, has been um, pretty consistent in saying you absolutely will be a welcome member and, and this is a process. And, and a process that, that, will be, um, that will be, I think, faster 
then um, if and when it, it, it materialises meaningfully, because of course we're in the middle of a conflict, then would have been the case prior to, to the conflict. And NATO is, is similar um, with those hoops that you jump through in order to get into the organisation. Without going into what was promised and not in, in zero eight, and absolutely there, there is a question mark in many people's minds about the clarity of the offer back then. We just had a summit in Vilnius where, um, where again, I think NATO has been, has been absolutely clear. There is a mechanism for joining, it's the Membership Action Plan. Um, NATO um, is so cognizant of um, the protections that are valued by those who have joined since the organisation was, was, was created, um, which have incidentally resulted in the expansion that, that we've been talking about. The Warsaw Pact, or former Warsaw Pact states, who are now members of NATO, um, wanted to join and expanded the organisation because they wanted those protections, and that is the protection that Ukraine also wants. So whilst there is a question mark over when, and, and the exact uh, shaping associated with joining both of those organisations. I think, I think pretty much everybody um, associated with that conversation acknowledges both the desire that Ukraine has and the reasons why um, it wishes to be and will be supported in meeting the objectives required. Anything you'd like to comment on? I would probably uh, comment on internal conflicts within Ukraine, uh, which was one of the uh, questions. Uh, uh, I would agree that Ukraine ha had uh, always had quite quite a diverse uh, political scene with various political forces and uh, sometimes uh, radically disagreeing among themselves. We've, we've had elements of uh, uh, pro-Russian separatism in Crimea and in, in Donbass in the 1990s. None of these elements developed into an armed conflict because uh, none of these forces within Ukraine was willing or uh, interested in taking up arms and started uh, starting a civil war essentially until 2014 when uh, both the annexation of Crimea and uh, the uh, pro-Russian uh, separatism in, in Donbass started because of an interference from outside. In both cases, these were the armed uh, personnel, military personnel, uh, which uh, crossed the border from Russia, uh, Russia and started each of these uh, conflicts. So uh, within Ukraine, uh, certainly there are different political forces, different opinions, as you would expect in a lot of um, other countries in Europe and in the world. But there was certainly no appetite for starting an armed conflict for, from within Ukraine at that time. We have time for one brief question. Uh, yes. Well, Mike, Mike, Mike. Thank you. Yes. I'd like to ask about economic issues. Uh, the sanctions imposed on Russia, yes, but the UK and other countries are buying cheap uh, Oil, uh, cheap um, goods from India and China, uh, increasingly electric vehicles and so forth, used with subsidized Russian gas and oil. Uh, the uh, search for um, the rare earth metals for the green technology, Russia has a great number, Ukraine has, uh, has great reserves too, particularly the Donbass area. Uh, China, of course, and, and India. I'm thinking, looking to the future, you know, China and India are benefiting economically and they, uh, the indigenous people of the world are suffering. Uh, there are reserves in the Congo, there are reserves in South America and in the Bra Brazil and, and whatnot. So, so we have to kind of look, the, the biggest battle perhaps is, you know, to save the planet, to save life on earth. And how is the conflict in Ukraine helping when so much, um, so many petrochemical industries and, and arms, you know, all the traditional carbon producing um, companies are benefiting in some way or another, particularly Western companies, they're thriving. <laughs> so it just, a mixture of economic issues. Thank you. Okay, would you like to come back to that? I'll probably catch up later. Yeah, okay. Dr. Money, any thoughts on that? I mean, if I'm understanding your correct your question, it's that we should be focusing on something else, or? Well, well there's a bigger, there's an even bigger battle. 
because my, my, my question always with this is what what do you think the alternative is? Um, uh, isn't well, the purpose of, I've got to interject, I've got the purpose here is to talk about Ukraine and oh, oh, sorry, not okay. world global okay. issues, which I think, I think there's, there's a challenge in Ukraine. Awesome. Thank you. And, and, and that probably leads us to my question is there's a challenge in Ukraine of, I think there is, you, you're alluding to like a, a resource grab and I, and I think as the environment becomes more challenging and growth of food etc becomes worse you'll see more nations looking at metals for you know metals for phones you look at china and taiwan you look at russia and you look at ukraine which is like seen as the red basket of europe you know it's always seen as a um and, and i do wonder why nothing happened in when when crimea was annexed why there was so little news reaction I, you know obviously i was around at that time I don't remember seeing a huge sway of information. I remember seeing something on the news about something happening somewhere in Europe, but there wasn't the reaction. And, and I do, I would love to understand why there was such a lack of a reaction then and how much that's contributed to where we are now. Okay, we have time for just one person to respond. Perhaps I can ask you, Professor Zubok. Yes, uh, no, doubt, no doubt uh, the weak reaction after the annexation of Crimea created a certain narrative that uh, emboldened Putin. We, we all know it. Uh, at the same time, you know, why uh, that reaction was weak? You know, it's tempting to look at uh, Obama, the Obama presidency as being sort of reticent and uh, tired of the two long wars the United States were having at the time in Iraq and Afghanistan, not to be forgotten. <laughs> Uh, that ended shortly before the uh, before Putin's war, but I think, uh, and it may be just uh, my imagination, but you know, the United States is uh, is the leader of the global uh, liberal order, and looking from Washington at the world, everything is so entangled, including oil and gas markets, energy markets, including chain of uh, chain supply and everything. And, you know, it was just Washington was not ready that such a challenge, such a bold stroke against this world order could have been, could be delivered from Moscow and was reluctant to approach this question. But indeed, we seen today with the second year of the war coming to the end rapidly that how many things already have changed in the world and changed in the fundamental way. Yeah, the military warfare uh, uh, was revolutionized by the war in Ukraine. Uh, aside from fears of China's imminent invasion of Taiwan, we're now thinking of automated and robotic drones used on massive scale. And I, this should send all the generals of all armies to redraw their contingency plans right now. In, in economic sphere, the war has shaped the global energy and food markets. Europe stopped buying Russian gas and so on and so forth. India and China are beneficiaries of this. The coordination of global climate policies appears in jeopardy. The rivalry over the Arctic intensified. The Earth's orbit became again a field of global competition and potential conflict. We live in a new world, and it is just a regional European war, uh, not, 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 not a global war that we're having. So we have to face it with uh, sobriety and responsibility, I guess. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that as your, your final thoughts and I'll just ask, um, I'll ask the other panellists to just have one minute roughly to anything you want to add, anything you don't feel that we managed to touch on. Uh, yes, I think uh, just, uh, just to round up, uh, certainly um, uh, the, the conflict uh, is uh, in its uh, really complex stage at the moment, but we are likely to see some developments, uh, maybe not over the next six months, but well, possibly over the uh, next year. And uh, we, we don't know whether this will be something that will be encouraged by events on the battlefield or uh, events in the broader world on the economic sphere, but uh, there are likely to be some changes in incidents direction so I'll okay. wait for them. Final thoughts from yourself. This has been um, a global shock. We I think see with Ukraine that war is not passe nor is it far away. We see that alliances matter. We see the horrendous impact of conflict on individuals. We see that traditional threats remain that hard power 
is still incredibly important and the ability to protect yourself remains critical and that security is multifaceted. So to the last point about um, all of the different um, vectors and nodes, um, these things relate to each other. You can't just look at one thing. You can't just look at, um, at a, a dimension of security, economic or environmental or societal alone. You need to understand them as being connected because if you don't, you are not going to be able to correctly and usefully and accurately determine how you can make things better. Thank you. Um, a couple of brief points before I let you go. You can fill in the survey about the festival and give feedback. You can do that uh, automatically if you booked on Eventbrite, you'll get an email or there are paper copies of the survey at the back with little pencils. Um, and yes, they'd appreciate your thoughts on, on how to improve the festival. There are many more events taking place uh, over today and tomorrow and Friday. There's a discussion on 25 years of devolution in the UK at six o'clock today. And there's an in conversation discussion with Michael Portillo at 1 p.m. tomorrow, and many others. So I hope you can join us. I'd like to thank you for your insightful and thoughtful questions and debate. Um, and I'd like to thank our panelists, Professor Zubok and Dr. Aliyev and Dr. Murray. Thank you very much. <laughs>